Um, this reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 14. If you'd like to follow along. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owes a hundred owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any one of these little ones should perish. Uh, hi, my name's Rob, and I'm part of the staff team that works alongside the uh, students of the Christian Union, and it's great to be here with you. Uh, we've been reading about the astonishing Jesus each week from Matthew's Gospel, and one of the benefits of doing that is that we just we read things that we don't necessarily we wouldn't necessarily have chosen uh, to look at each week. So that actually we're trying to let God set the agenda as we read the Bible each week rather than just choosing the topics that we want to do. And as you will have heard, as this passage was read, Jesus here talks about children and how they are treated, and uh, that uh, is a very topical thing for us in Australia. You may well uh, be familiar with this. Uh, Although it's been going on for quite a long time, but perhaps if you've recently moved to Australia, then this would be news to you. But perhaps... And probably similar things may have been happening in your own home country. Uh, In 2012, the then Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, announced a Royal Commission. A Royal Commission into institutional responses to child abuse. After many years of all kinds of rumours and allegations uh, and various, uh, various legal proceedings, it was decided that a Royal Commission was needed to work out exactly what was going on. And the Commission met for five years and issued its final report in 2017. It heard evidence from 8,000 survivors of child sexual abuse and read a further 1,000 written submissions. It uncovered uh, sexual abuse going on in institutions across Australian society. Uh, from the Scouts, the YMCA, the Armed Services, the Police Force, uh, doctors and healthcare uh, organisations, childcare services, schools, sports clubs, youth support services and so on. Uh, Perhaps the most shocking thing that that was discovered was that 58% of the abuse that was uncovered Uh, took place in institutions managed by a religious organisation. Most of those organisations that would call themselves Christian. 32% happened in uh, government-run institutions and 10% in other institutions. There was abuse recorded in 1,691 different religious institutions. Uh, The stories of abuse contained in the report, in the 17 volumes of the report, are horrific. The summary uh, at the start said this, tens of thousands of children have been sexually abused in many Australian institutions. We will never know the true number. Whatever the number, it is a national tragedy perpetuated over generations within many of our most trusted institutions. 
So uh, a large majority, actually, of the recorded instances of abuse happen within religious institutions. 58% of those, 61% are within Catholic church institutions. Almost as horrifying as the abuse itself was also uh, the systemic failure to act, to take victims seriously, uh, the cover-up of people's crimes, the extraordinary leniency shown to offenders, uh, and the way that uh, people reporting abuse were not believed and were marginalised and so on. Uh, the report says, in many cases, the, the failings of institutions have been exacerbated by the manifestly inadequate response to the abused person. The problems have been so widespread and the nature of the abuse so heinous that it is difficult to comprehend. Well, in the light of that terrible story, uh, how would we respond? How should people respond? Uh, if you're not a Christian, maybe even if you are a Christian, you, you might conclude that, well, if that is what is going to happen in religious institutions and institutions calling themselves Christian, then we could really do with less religion and less Christianity. Uh, that actually the less religion that there is, then presumably the less abuse will occur. And personally, uh, it wouldn't be surprising if people also responded, well, if that is what Christians are like, then that just gives me one more reason not to seriously consider Jesus. If you are a Christian, yeah, I think there are several ways that we might be thinking of responding, uh, ways that you might have responded and ways that I've been or felt that I was tempted to respond. Uh, one sort of general response is to deflect or deny or minimise or in various ways uh, avoid uh, the sense that this has anything to do with me. One of the things that people might say is that, well, look, this was, as the report says, a society-wide problem, that social institutions across the nation uh, were involved in this. And uh, that this is only about institutional settings, not about personal or family settings, what was going on there. We might say, well, if everyone was doing it, apparently, and so it's not particularly the responsibility of the church or of Christians. Uh, but I would suggest to you that it's never been an excuse that everyone was doing it uh, that would be considered adequate for a Christian. That we're meant to be people who are different, who are shining lights in the society, and it's simply not enough to say that this was a general problem. Or you might uh, have a more individualistic kind of response. You might say, well, look, it, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Uh, or something maybe along the lines of, well, it wasn't my church. It wasn't my denomination. And, well, I mean, this may be to some extent true, uh, and this might be a, a temptation for those of us, especially who are in uh, independent churches that don't have formal links with other churches. But, of course, in the end, we believe that there is actually only one church of Jesus Christ, one worldwide body of believers, that anything that someone does in the name of Jesus, to some extent, is connected to us and reflects on us. Or we might say, well, look at, yes, this was, this happened, uh, this was people who called themselves Christians, but it was, they were not really our kind of Christian. They weren't really our kind. They weren't really like us. Well, once again, that may be to some extent true, but in some ways we are prepared to accept uh, praise that comes to the whole church for good things that all kinds of Christians do. We must be prepared actually to own up to what other Christians do as well. Just as this is a national tragedy, as the report said, and the whole nation has to bear some responsibility, so it is with the church. Well, we might be tempted to despair and give up and say, well, we just can't trust any institutions, let alone religious institutions. We might agree with people that there is no future for Christianity of this kind. But I think before we do that, we really need to go back to Jesus. 
we need to reconsider what Jesus says and try and understand it and think of and understand the best way forward from here. So that's what I'd like to do tonight. So if you can grab your hand out there and open it up uh, and we'll look at what Jesus says in this passage. It begins with uh, the disciples coming to Jesus and saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, this could be genuine spiritual curiosity uh, about spiritual greatness, but it's probably more likely that this is another self-seeking and self-promoting kind of moment from the disciples. We know that they argued among themselves about who was the greatest. Seems childish, but that's what's reported to us. Arguing about who is the best, who is the greatest. And even, in fact, they continued to do this right up until the night that Jesus was betrayed. Luke tells us in his gospel, at the Last Supper, they were having an argument about who was the greatest. Okay, so this is a chronic problem among the disciples. And um, Jesus responds to them. It's worth thinking about, what are they actually asking? What does it mean to be great in the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's worth saying this is that the kingdom of heaven is not heaven. Right, the word heaven here stands in for God. It's a way of talking about God without using God's name. And Jesus used the term kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven pretty much interchangeably in the gospel. So he's talking about God's kingdom. What does he mean by that? Well, not, not so much a place, but a situation, a state of affairs where things are put right, where God's will is done on earth as in heaven. That's Jesus' kind of explanation of it as he teaches the disciples to pray. You can look that up. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6. When God puts things right in the world, when things are the way God wants them to be, that is God's kingdom. It's the promise of God through his prophets that 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 will come about, that God will bring his kingdom into this world. And so what the disciples are asking is, when that happens, when God puts things right, which one of us is going to get recognised as the most kingdom person? Right, the, the number one, but the person who most embodies the spirit of the kingdom. That's, that's the kind of thing they're asking. Which one of us is going to be the, 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 the top kingdom person? And Jesus uh, has to sort them out. And what he does is he, he says, well, okay, you want to know what that looks like? Who really embodies the kingdom? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus has to actually show them that they're in danger of missing out on the kingdom altogether. It's not just, the issue here is not just who's going to be greatest. The question is who's in, who's going to be part of, and they're in danger of not being part of because of their attitude. He says that they need to become like little children, like this little child, and that that is the way to true greatness. Uh, so what is it about a child? What is it about this small child that particularly is an example to them? It's the lowly, humble position of this child, the lowly status, and uh, the kind of person that a little child is. Uh, because little children, even in ancient Hebrew society, didn't have power, didn't have status. They were totally reliant on others. And you will know that little children uh, can't do things on their own. So here is the example of the kind of attitude that's needed. Think of a small child, like a two-year-old. What do they do? What do they say? Mum, can I have something to eat? Dad... I hurt my foot. Mum, I'm scared. Dad, I'm thirsty. That kind of attitude of total dependence and reliance, that kind of attitude of not saying, I'm important, I can do stuff, I don't need any help. That's the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about. To become like a little child is to become like someone who totally relies on Jesus, completely relies on God, um, doesn't make any claims before God, but only asks for help, only admits their own weakness and need. That's the kind of thing uh, that means a person can be part of God's kingdom. 
humble faith, humble trust, humble reliance. And uh, so Jesus has really said to them, look, you, you need to change. You really need to turn around and change your whole attitude, not seeking after greatness in this way, but humbly trusting in God. And uh, then Jesus goes on with an, a war, kind of warning and encouragement about how they treat children. And through the passage, Jesus is kind of, it's, it's not sort of a linear progression here. Jesus is going to deal with a number of different topics, and it's not, it doesn't flow in a logical kind of order the way that maybe you might be going for in one of your essays or whatever. On the other hand, it's not random either. It's not just a, a few random thoughts by Jesus. It's thematic. It kind of, it kind of just goes from. It's sort of like one thing triggers off the next, off the next, off the next. Uh, it, you know, it's more like someone riffing on a theme uh, in various ways than a sort of logical argument that keeps going. And you'll notice that in Jesus' teaching a lot, it's the images that set off various new things. Okay. So he started talking about children, and now Jesus is particularly talking to the disciples about well, how they treat children. First of all, verse 5, positively, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. How are you disciples when you become important leaders in the church going to treat children? Well, welcome them in my name. Don't disregard them, don't belittle them, don't ignore them, but welcome them. And if you do that, actually what you're doing is welcoming me. This is something that Jesus says in his teaching. It's, it's there in uh, the, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats as well, in the explanation, that the way you treat Jesus' followers, especially the most humble ones, the poorest, the smallest, whatever, that's how you treat Jesus. That is a sign of how you regard Jesus, how you treat others. So, and so it's really important that they welcome and include children. Children are going to be part of Jesus' church. They are going to be members of Jesus' church. And they need to be welcomed as you would welcome Jesus himself. And then negatively there is uh, the warning, verse 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Uh, here Jesus, uh, he slightly shifts the emphasis of what he's teaching from talking about children to talking about little ones. And obviously children are literally little ones, right? But little ones becomes a, a kind of bigger category for all the, the everyday followers of Jesus. All the normal, everyday, not the, not the big bosses, not the leaders, the everyday followers of Jesus. And you can see that here. He says, those who believe in me. The ordinary people who believe in Jesus, however powerless they are, however poor they are, whatever they are, uh, they are the little ones. And it's Jesus' common way of speaking about his followers. What does he say about them? Don't cause them to stumble. Don't cause them to stumble. So the picture here is of the, the, the life we live as a kind of journey. This is a very common sort of image, isn't it? The life we live is a kind of journey, and for Christians, it is a journey towards the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Where we are headed is God's future. We want to be part of it. We don't want to miss out on it. And so we're on that journey. So you can imagine we're walking along through life, and as we walk along, there are obstacles. Things get in the way. There are all kinds of problems and issues that make it difficult to live the Christian life and to continue in the Christian life. And the image Jesus uses here is that they're stumbling blocks. They're things that might cause a person to stumble on their journey or even fall. Maybe even fall so badly that they don't get up. Maybe even fall so badly that they don't make it to the end. Stumbling blocks. Jesus says, do not be a stumbling block. Do not place a stumbling block in the way of one of these little ones on their journey to God's kingdom. Or else. He doesn't say exactly what's going to happen here, but he says, he says what would be better? It would be better if you were drowned in a, in a radical way. To have a millstone tied around your neck. Now, uh, you know what a millstone is? Okay? In the, 
apparently in the olden days they would grind grain uh, in order to make flour by grinding it between two large stones and the stone would be so big that it would probably be turned by a, a donkey walking around. Okay, so we're talking about a huge stone on top of another huge stone. In fact, Jesus says a large millstone, that is the, the even bigger one underneath that the donkey doesn't have to move. Okay, that one. It would be better if that one was tied around your neck and you thrown into the ocean than cause one of those little ones to stumble. He's using a very vivid image to say, whatever God is going to do to you for doing that to any of them, to causing them to stumble, whatever God is going to do, it's going to be worse than that. And so we would be encouraged to hear very clearly here. Do not do it. Do not cause them to stumble. God cares about that extremely. Jesus goes on, Woe to the world because of things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. There are going to be stumbling blocks in life, but you don't have to be one. You don't have to be one to other people. In fact, you mustn't be one to others, and especially to the little ones, to the children. So Jesus is clearly and emphatically against anything that would harm the little ones, the children. Uh, He goes on and he actually makes it a more general point about stumbling. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Jesus says, don't, you, you have to make sure you don't stumble as well. If you cause others to stumble, then you are stumbling. And if you are stumbling, then you're in great spiritual danger. The danger is of hell itself. And you have to be completely ruthless and make sure that you don't do that and you don't end up there. Do anything you need to do to make sure you don't stumble in the Christian life. Do anything you need to do to make sure that you don't miss out on God's kingdom. The image here, the language of hell and the fire, is the language of the rubbish dump. It comes from the city of Jerusalem itself. It had a great big rubbish tip where people just threw rubbish over the side of the hill and it all gathered down the hill and all burnt and it was horrible and wormy and that's the image, right? Don't get thrown onto God's rubbish heap. Don't get thrown onto God's rubbish heap. Do not cause others to stumble. Make sure you don't stumble yourself. Jesus goes on. uh, And he actually says a bit more about God's concern for the little ones. Verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Uh, well, just to add a little bit to it, the, li- the, the little ones have spiritual representatives. I'm not even sure what Jesus is talking about here. The word angels is the word messengers. Jesus says they've got messengers with God. If you hurt them, God will know about it, I think is the bottom line there. What do you think, Jesus says? The man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away. Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go and look for the one that wandered off? What is Jesus saying? Well, God cares for each and every one of them. God cares for each and every one. The prophet Ezekiel said that God himself is going to come and rescue his sheep because the shepherds of Israel, the leaders, were terrible leaders. And so God was going to come and find them. And here is Jesus telling the same story. Jesus is God come to find the lost sheep. He cares for every one of them. And so should we. If God cares for them, then so should we. Well, I think if you see uh, what Jesus says here, then uh, these events of sexual abuse uh, within Christian institutions should never have happened. I think that we can see that clearly. They shouldn't have happened and they would never have happened if people had taken Jesus seriously at his word. 
if people had lived by Jesus' teaching and believed what he says here, then uh, those children would have been safe. And I think what is needed to stop this from happening again is not less religion or less Christianity, but more, more Jesus, more seriousness about Jesus, more complete devotion to Jesus and his teaching. The Royal Commission made lots of recommendations and uh, some of them are general, some of them are specific for different religious groups. And even before the Commission reported, uh, lots and lots of changes were made in churches and church institutions to the way that children were protected. And if you've done, you know, if you've been a youth group leader or anything like that or taught Sunday school, you'll know that this is true. You have to go through a very rigorous screening process and there are all kinds of protocols in place and that's good. Uh, this has been very helpful. Uh, and it's, this is excellent and appropriate that there are good regimes for the protection of children. But in the end, what is most necessary, actually, is a change of heart. That people need to devote themselves to Jesus and his teaching and to hear the warnings and to hear the encouragements and take it deep into our heart. So that there are not just rules, but a total commitment to the safety and welfare and nurturing of children. Total unreserved commitment to their safety and their flourishing. And a total commitment to justice and restitution for those who've been harmed. That we actually need to hear Jesus' words and say, we will commit ourselves to that. And that as far as it lies within our power, the church in the future in Australia will be a safe and loving and welcoming place for all children. A change of heart. Just one last thing before I finish that. And I want to ask you this. Why is it that we think it's wrong? Why is it that we think... Why is it that Australians have thought that it's wrong? Why are people concerned? Well, you might say, uh, well, look, isn't it just obvious? Isn't it self-evident that to treat children in this way is wrong? Surely any right-thinking person anywhere at any time would realise that, right? But I think it's a mistake to think in, those, in that way. It isn't obvious to others. Uh, people haven't always thought that this is wrong. For many people, it's not been obvious that this is not something that should be done. People in other times, people of other cultures, have seen things quite differently. Most people, in most places, at most times, would not have thought that this was a big problem. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, in which Christianity emerged, uh, the sexual use of children was not considered wrong or even unusual. Uh, it was entirely normal and unremarkable. Boys and girls were prostituted. Male and female slaves were used as sex slaves, including children. This was legal and normal. It's also worth pointing out that uh, the unwanted children were often exposed, that is, they were left to die in the wilderness, and that this also was completely normal. Uh, it's probably fair to assume, given uh, those things, that other kinds of sexual exploitation of children were also rife in ancient society. And in all of this, ancient uh, Roman culture was like most cultures in the East and in the West, ancient times, medieval and modern. So what changed? What changed? Well, I want to suggest to you that the, the most important thing that changed was that Jesus said these words. That this incident and then the one that we'll hear about in Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus welcomed and blessed the children are the single most important reason we think it's wrong to abuse children in this way and to exploit them.
in anyone, in fact. The single most important reason, in fact, that we have high expectations of how children are treated. This is Jesus at his most astonishing, totally challenging what was normal. I believe that human beings have a moral sense, that all human beings have some moral sense, some sense of right and wrong. But I also believe that that sense is deeply damaged and flawed. And what Jesus does is actually brings clarity to us. Brings complete clarity about what is right and wrong in God's eyes. So that means that Jesus is not only the saviour who rescues us from our sins and helps us to be part of God's kingdom. He's also the teacher who we need to help us know how to live our lives in every respect, including this one. And that is why I think if you hate child abuse, you should love Jesus. And if you love Jesus, then you must hate child abuse. Why don't we pray and why have some time for questions? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, that Jesus opens our eyes, that Jesus brings light where there's darkness, that Jesus brings real change. We're so sorry that this terrible thing has happened. We know that you care deeply. We know that you will bring justice. We know that you will bring healing. That you will wipe away every tear. We thank you so much. We pray in your mercy for real change within the churches, real change of heart among all your people, real change in this whole society. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.